A judge finds himself in hot water and suspended after being charged with a violent assault. Can he remain on the bench? We break it down with retired judge Fanon Rucker. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. So we usually cover stories about judges presiding over criminal cases, but now we have a judge who apparently is the subject of a criminal case himself. Yes, Harris County, Texas criminal court judge Frank Aguilar of the 228th Criminal District Court has been suspended for, quote, a pending criminal matter. This comes after he was charged for allegedly assaulting his girlfriend on New Year's Eve. Now, more specifically, repeatedly punching her in the face and putting his foot on her head and chest area, some reporting indicating her neck. Yeah, yikes. Now, Aguilar was arrested for assault and bodily injury family violence. He's currently out on a $1,500 bond. Now, as we break this down, I want to bring in the perfect guest. Yeah, definitely the perfect guest. A guest who I think is perfect always, but specifically for this subject, attorney and former judge Fanon Rucker is with us. He served in the Ham- Hamilton County Municipal Court in Ohio. Judge, good to see you. Good to see you too, Jesse. Thanks for having me on. Of course, I apologize. My, I, I'm losing my voice, but I'm powering through it. But let's talk about this. Um, so, such a fascinating case. The State Commission on Judicial Conduct said that uh, this was a pending criminal matter, and under Rule 15A, any judge can be suspended from office with or without pay, he's being with pay, by this commission, quote, for immediately upon being indicted by a state or federal grand jury for a felony offense or charged with a misdemeanor involving official misconduct. What are your thoughts on this? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Quite a few things are interesting about it. First of all, the fact that the irony uh, that this is a criminal court judge who is now, who specifically does the, uh, uh, who specifically presides over criminal cases is now the subject of his own uh, criminal case. You know, every state has different rules when it comes to judicial conduct. Uh, certainly Ohio has ours. And, and if you travel through different states, there are some consistencies, but there are also some uh, particulars that certain states have. I had never seen where the rules specifically state the particulars that if a judge is indicted for a felony or if there are certain types of misdemeanors that they can be and will be removed or suspended with or without pay. That certainly is not the case here in Ohio. So it's interesting that Texas, um, with the foresight that they have of how their judges should uh, behave in office, decided that that is an appropriate rule and they actually enforced it here. It brings well, up some that, interesting questions about that, how they decided. That's so interesting. So you're saying in Ohio, a judge could be arrested, could be charged, but as long as the case hasn't been adjudicated, as long as they haven't been convicted, they can remain on the bench in Ohio? Absolutely correct. Wow. And, and that's why it brings up a few interesting questions. Uh, the judge is presumed, of course, as every other citizen, every other citizen, innocent unless and until proven guilty. But what the law and the rules there allow for is for the removal of this judge with pay based on a presumption of that innocence, based on an allegation um, before the person is actually even found guilty or um, although if you're indicted, I suppose that it's been established that there is in fact probable cause, meaning that something happened. uh, It's likely that something happened uh, such that the case can move forward. But but it's an interesting argument um, of the consequences simply based on an allegation made by somebody else. Well, apparently he might have a way to stay on the bench because the rules say that he has a right to a post suspension hearing to prove that he can continue to serve and will not jeopardize the interest of any parties and court proceedings that he's presiding over, nor will it impair public confidence. How would he be able to show that at a hearing like that? Yeah. Well, you, you know, uh, it's it's a question of due process. You cannot deprive someone of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And so the argument that the state bar has the ability, the Supreme Court there has the ability to suspend him with or without pay, well, there has to be some type of process in place to challenge that. What, for example, is as, you know, uh, has happened in some times, the person making the allegation has malicious intent. And that can be shown early on in the process. Or what if the process takes an inordinately long period of time and the judge is suspended without pay during that time? So it's it's important that there is a process where that can be challenged. What does he need to show? 
in order to uh, be able to resume the bench? Not sure, but I'm guessing it'll be something to the effect of this didn't happen or this was a, uh, a family dispute that um, perhaps uh, will be resolved without consequence or without punishment, um, such that no question of the administration of justice will be uh, legitimately raised. Um, there's a number of things I think that can be shown, but I, I'm sure that the disciplinary committee will be looking into his background, looking into prior uh, uh, complaints possibly against the judge to find out how likely it is that this actually occurred and the impact of such a conviction or even an allegation on someone who holds the public trust in the way that this judge does. I'm going to get to that, his past, in a minute. Before I do, at the beginning of the month, the Harris County prosecutors, they filed documents that they wanted him to recuse himself from at least seven domestic violence cases that were pending before him. He refused and uh, didn't want, didn't feel that that was appropriate. I mean, maybe it's the type of cases that he should be able to preside over. Maybe he shouldn't preside over domestic violence cases. Um, but should be able to preside over other kinds of cases. What are your thoughts on that? The fact that he was fighting back and says, no, I, I should be able to hear these kinds of cases. Yeah, so, so both sides have a, um, a, a legitimate reason to argue their positions. The prosecutor has a legitimate reason to argue that here is someone um, who presides over these types of cases. We believe in the strongest uh, possible sense with the evidence that we've seen that he has in fact committed the type of offense that he's presiding over and it's just not appropriate. So we're gonna push the envelope to say, we, we're convinced that he committed these types of offenses and we're so sure about it that we're saying that he shouldn't even be able to preside over these. That's, that's a strong prosecutor position. Well, the judge has a strong position in saying, no, um, number one, I didn't do this. I'm, I'm not guilty until proven, uh, until proven so by the state. But more importantly, I have the ability to be fair and unbiased in all that I do. I've been doing that uh, up until now. And so I'm going to tell you right now, despite what I'm charged with, despite what I'm alleged to have engaged in, I can and should be able to preside over all the kind of cases that come before me um, between now and the time that I'm no longer a judge. He, he has to argue that um, rather than acquiesce, because in acquiescence, it would be to many publicly a, an acknowledgement of some amount of guilt on his end. See, the thing for the way I think about it is in terms of the public confidence in his being able to preside over these cases and also the ability for defense attorneys down the line to use this as an issue for him to be removed. Why do I say that? Because, you know, the reporting indicates that um, this suspension is in place until his case is dropped or he's acquitted. But for me, even if that were to happen, I wonder if he can even remain on the bench because um, he apparently was reportedly charged but found not guilty of a of attacking another girlfriend back in 2010 when he was a Karras County magistrate. So now you're seeing what could be alleged repeated patterns of this. And I just feel that for the public confidence and the ability of defense attorneys to perhaps make this an issue for him to recuse himself in other cases, that even if he's acquitted or even if the case is dropped, how does he stay on? And I know, I know we're kind of beating the, the bush here with this, and you've made excellent points about due process, but you see my concern? Of course. But ultimately, when we're talking about uh, positions like the, this judge held and positions like I held until I retired, that is um, the public is our employer. It's the votes that people cast right. that make the decision ultimately whether they think that I'm fit or appropriate to stay in a particular position. He apparently was elected or appointed by uh, some neutral body to that position after the initial allegation. And I don't know this judge's term, but again, the, whoever is running against him, I would presume, would uh, not let the voting population forget that these, um, these indications of smoke may point to some fire that may be burning uh, with this judge and that he is not appropriate to be in this position. But the public confidence um, that the Supreme Court is, is, uh, is focused on is not so much about the individual um, uh, confidence, excuse me, the individual whom they may or may not have confidence in, but the entirety of the judicial system. And although that is most certainly um, a, a very important, you know, uh, focus of the court, right. it, it, it's, it's tough to measure when you're talking about the public being able to vote someone in or out 
um, based on what people know that they're engaged in that may be um, salacious or may not be appropriate um, for, for many people to support them. Talking all of this law, by the way, let me just take a minute to talk to you about our incredible sponsor here on Sidebar, Morgan & Morgan, which is actually the largest personal injury law firm in America. I like talking about Morgan & Morgan because not all law firms are the same. And Morgan & Morgan, what they have done is they have taken a really complicated legal process and completely modernized it for their clients. From submitting your claim to signing contracts to talking to your legal team, they make it possible for you to do all of this right on your smartphone. You can see if you have a case in just a few minutes. And when I say case, I'm talking about how your injury could be worth millions. That's because Morgan & Morgan doesn't settle for lowball offers. In the past couple of months, Morgan & Morgan saw verdicts of $12 million in Florida, $6.8 million in New York, and $26 million in Philadelphia. Now, mind you, this is considerably higher than the highest insurance offers for these accidents. It's important to take action to protect your rights. And also, get this, the fee is absolutely free unless you win. So to start your claim now with Morgan & Morgan, go to forthepeople.com slash LC sidebar or click the link in the description and pinned in the comments. If he is convicted or if he pleads guilty, does that mean his time on the bench is over? Interesting, not necessarily. Um, you know, certain states, again, have certain prohibitions on the ability of individuals to run for or to hold office, depending on the types of conviction that they have. Every state does not preclude people who have felony convictions from participating in office. Every state does not require um, a clean record for someone to be a judge or even to practice law. If in Texas, um, he has to prove that he is worthy to continue to represent the public in this capacity, because you know um, lawyers and judges have an obligation uh, to uphold the administration of justice and to avoid conflicts of interest and those types of things. The conviction itself is not a rubber stamp reason that he would be removed. Mm -hmm. There still has to be a showing by the Supreme Court um, or whoever brings the uh, complaints against him that in fact he has violated some of the rules of professional conduct or judicial rules of conduct that in fact prohibit him from uh, serving in that capacity, but it's not automatic. I, I just, I, if he gets convicted or takes a deal, in my opinion, I, I don't see a scenario where he stays. You could be right, but I just, I just don't see it. And by the way, what makes this even more complicated is this district, the 228th district court, it is handling this very big local criminal case regarding a raid in which police killed two residents. Several author, uh, officers were injured. It's been pending for the last five years. It still hasn't gone to trial. I wonder what this development would do to a case as high profile as that. Well, what we heard is that he is uh, presides over criminal cases. And so presumably he would not be involved. Now, what the, the question would be is whether any of the officers involved in his case have some involvement in that larger case. Mm. Because, you know, if we're talking about, you know, questionable um, actions by law enforcement, it's not just that their um, actions and that their procedures are criticized in the case before the court. If the attorneys are, are good in what they do and critical in what they do, they're looking at all of the cases that those officers involved in to find some reason that they were inappropriate or, or not, um, uh, not following procedures. And so if somehow the police officers involved in his case have some involvement in that very high profile case, it could open doors and questions and comments and yeah. considerations for more than just the case that they're involved in very publicly. That's a, such a good point. Because, judge. It's such a good point because even taking that case away, the officers that arrested him, if they turn out to be witnesses in a case that he's presiding over, I feel like he's got to recuse himself. Under those circumstances, that's right. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, as, as judges, we are um, criticized, not criticized, we are um, discouraged from simply recusing ourselves if a defense attorney or if a prosecutor says, hey, we want you to recuse yourself. It's supposed to be a, a pretty um, a careful point of introspection to decide if we believe we can, in fact, be fair and, and, and unbiased in our position on the case. And 99% yeah. of the time, judge is going to fall in the, in the area of saying, yes, I can be fair and unbiased, no matter um, what may be some of the issues here. But in, in cases like that, you have, to, you have to be logical and say, yeah, this officer put me in handcuffs. 
probably shouldn't hear a case where there's going to be a cross examination and a question of this officer's yeah. credibility. I'm still pretty mad at him for what happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know who there's there's no issues of bias or issues of uh, problematic behavior or issues of uh, any kind of uh, conflicts. Former Judge Fanon Rucker. He's this is the standard, everybody. This is the standard. We're all trying to get to that level. Thank you so much for coming on, sir. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jesse. That's all we have for you here on Sidebar, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. Speak to you next time. Thank you.